And we are live here on the MMA Industry Podcast. I'm, of course, your host, James Lynch. And today I have a very special guest, someone who I've looked up to in this industry since I started watching the sport, basically. Uh, his name is uh, Josh Gross. Uh, you might be familiar with him. He's done a lot of work, doing a lot of work right now. Of course, he is one of the hosts of the Outsiders Podcast, which you can find on Patreon. He's a contributor to The Guardian. And he's also an author of a really great book, Ali versus Inoki, The Forgotten Fight That Inspired Mixed Martial Arts. I think I got everything, Josh. How are you today? I'm great, James. You did. You got a lot of it, and I appreciate all of it. Thank you so much. No problem. It's uh, great to have you on here. And, uh, you know, I had you on my podcast a couple of years ago, and it was uh, it was definitely a must-have to get you back on this show because this is the show where we talk about uh, what goes on uh, in the industry and everything like that. And uh, you're a guy that I've, uh, like I said, followed for a very long time. I think people who have been fans of the sport since the Ultimate Fighter days or even before that, uh, you know, would definitely recognize your work. But uh, let's start at the very beginning first. Um, I, how did you first get involved in the media industry as far as uh, covering MMA? Uh, well, I was around mixed martial arts, you know, really starting like 97, 98. Southern California was a hotbed for me. I'm L.A. born and raised. And I think like every other red-blooded male at that point had some sense of what the UFC was or heard of Hoist Gracie. It wasn't on my radar. I was a big sports fan. I've dedicated basically all my empty free time and even time I didn't have to, you know, following the Dodgers and being up on the box scores and playing fantasy football and just like living that kind of life. Um, then I met a few fighters and I felt like this is a world that was interesting to me. And I started training. I was training with Boss Rudin and Oleg Taktarov in 98 before Boss went to the UFC and fought Tsuyoshi Kasaka and met him. And martial arts really became something that was important to me. Um, I was in college. I went to San Diego State. And as part of a political science course, they wanted us to go to functions of California state government. I thought that sounded really boring, although I love politics and I love political science. I've been to around some of that and I was like, what? It, this is not appealing to me. But the California State Athletic Commission was going through the process of understanding if they want to put rules for mixed martial arts, if they wanted to regulate the sport. And I had a chance to go to some of those really early seminal athletic commission hearings where you know, Zufa wasn't even Zufa at that point. They didn't exist. And uh, I was there for the rulemaking process. I was there the day that California announced that, yes, we're we're going to adopt rules and we're going to move forward on this. And that was April 2000. And a friend of mine, Jeff Thaler, um, suggested that I write a story and send it out. I, I, I was into journalism. I was working at the school newspaper and uh, in Sitting State. And I felt like you know, this is, maybe I can do this. Maybe I can sort of combine. It wasn't, just, I mean, the sport wasn't something to write about. I was a fan and I was a participant. And um, I felt like, well, if I jump into this, then I can't really be a fan anymore because that was a pretty clear distinction for me. And I thought it was worth it because it was an extremely unique world with characters and richness. And there was so much motivation for me to go out there and start writing about it. And people were receptive to my writing uh, almost immediately which I thought was funny because I thought it was terrible. Um, you know, it, it it took a while for me to sort of craft my style and get a sense for, you know, what I was seeing and how to relay it to people and how to format it. I, mixed martial arts gave me a chance as a journalist to get into the ground floor of something, be as close as you possibly could to something. And and it was counterculture, so it had that element as well. And it gave me a, a great opportunity to learn and, and understand you're dealing with some dynamic people who, you know, may not like a question here or, you know, how, how are they going to deal with this here? And it, it taught me how I would deal with those scenarios pretty quickly. Um, so the first story I ever wrote was about the athletic, athletic commission hearing. It got published by Full Contact Fighter and other um, uh, outlets online. And Full Contact Fighter, Fighter basically said, hey, you're on the West Coast. Why don't you start covering stuff? And I almost immediately started going to the IFC events in, in Fresno, California and Friant, some of those great warrior challenge cars that have I mean, if you go look back on those cards, they're full of fighters you would have seen in the UFC. I started covering King of the Cage, uh, which was very important out here in Southern California at that time. King of the Cage 3, King of the Cage 4. I mean, these were big events and and all the way through. And uh, the next thing I knew, I was, you know, end of 2000 was the first time I'd ever been to Pride. <laughs> so that, wow. you know, it sort of like just skyrocketed from there. And I started covering Prides and for Full Contact Fighter and for Max Fighting. And the, it just kind of took off. I knew that this is what I wanted to do more than anything. And you know, fortunately, uh, it, it worked out well. So are you like, uh, like as far as, uh, you know, paying the bills and everything, did you have another job on the side while you were starting out or how did that work as far as you getting to cover yeah. this and then, you know, also trying to keep the lights on? No, it's a really good question. I was a, I was a college student and I was leaning on mom. I mean, really okay. it's, it's what it, what it was. I mean, that's yeah. the reality of it. Um, I, uh, 
I, I didn't mind going without, you know, I, I was like, I, I don't, I was just me and school and you know, my interest. And I felt like this was sort of my own education, getting out into the world and writing and reporting. Um, pretty soon mixed martial arts started to cover the bills for me. And I was fortunate that way. Um, I got an, while I was still in school, I got an offer to edit Fight Sport Magazine, which was run by Stephen Quadros, it was put oh, out nice. by Black Belt Fight Magazine. Professor. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it, it was, I wasn't making a lot of money. And if I had a uh, wife and a kids and family and, and all that sort of stuff and a mortgage, I don't know that I would have been able to pursue it the way that I did. But I just kind of, you know, scrounged my way through it and, and didn't mind living on the cheap and having roommates for a long time. And this was my passion, you know. Um, at a certain point, though, I really started to make a living and I was amazed that I could. I was just amazed that I could make a living in this sport because um, not a lot of people are able to pull that off. And if you do, you, you just you work in 24 seven, which is what I did for five, six years is at the height of, you know, when people sort of knew me at Sports Illustrated and ESPN and sure you know, th the work was my life more than anything. Yeah. And this is a common theme uh, when I have guests on the show is that you really have to be passionate about this. Nobody is getting in to, to covering MMA, trying to be a millionaire. It's just not a reality. And, and you really have to put in the extra hours and everything. And it's it's so cool to hear you go through that because a lot of uh, people that I've had on and including myself, you know, there's definitely lots of times when, you know, I'm, I want to have want to go with friends and stuff. But, you know, I got interviews to do or I got other things to do. So you really have to have that sort of uh, dedication. Yeah, I didn't. There, was, there was no social life at Sure Dog. I mean, I, it was 24 seven. I was executive editor of the website, breaking news, writing stories. You know, like so many people are today with their own uh, platforms and their own sites. And um, it, it comes down to passion, James. You're 100% right. Who were your mentors early on? Did you have anyone that you sort of would bounce ideas off of, especially when it came to writing? Because I know uh, you learn, obviously, in school, but, uh, you know, I'm sure you had other people that you sort of uh, picked their brain. Uh, a little here and there. I actually learned by doing more than learned okay. by being in school. I dropped out of school. Uh, I didn't finish San Diego State. I felt like I am editing this magazine. I'm traveling the world covering mixed martial arts. There's all this opportunity in this world in front of me, even though there was no sign yet of the ultimate fighter. There was no sign yet that this thing could blow up and be big. I believed in it. And so I felt that I would learn my best journalism by getting out in the world and actually practicing it. There's different schools of thought. I, I went to the classes. I understood what the basics of journalism are. I understood uh, legally what I can and can't do, what my ethics are. I understood that. And I took it upon myself to learn that stuff as well. I didn't need to sit in the classroom to have a teacher explain it to me. I felt like taking up my own interest, having my own passion, really being dedicated to the practice of journalism. It is a practice. It is an actual thing that you have to devote yourself to. And then being in this world that was really unique, um, it, it, it kind of just came together. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think that my story is necessarily that something I'm sure that there's pieces of my story that people can take for themselves and use what they want and find some motivation there. But I think in a lot of ways, mine was right time, right place with a unique passion. And, I, you know, I think in the end of the day, like I, I turned out to be a, a fairly uh, good journalist. I, I didn't mind pursuing stories that were difficult. Uh, I feel like the places that pursued me and hired me over the course of my career sort of validated my um, my instincts more than anything. And so. I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have somebody I said, oh, let me bounce this off you. Please read the story. I just wrote it and published and wrote and published and went out and made phone calls and hustled and hustled and hustled. And that was, that's it. If you don't have that hustle, if you don't have that passion, it's just never going to work out. Yeah, I completely agree. So how did you end up getting hired by SureDog? You talked about working for Full Contact Fighter. Where did that come together with you, uh, you know, starting there? And, and also a follow up, um, you know, did you feel like SureDog was going to be as big as it was at the time? Because that it was sort of the number one site out there, uh, at least, you know, back in the day. Oh, for sure it was. Um, I was, uh, I left Full Contact Fighter and um, I was focused on Fight Sport Magazine. Unfortunately, the people at Fight Sport, which was the black belt, um, editors really felt like, oh, this mixed martial arts thing, it's not going anywhere. We don't, we don't believe in it. And I was like, you, you realize they just taped this show out in Vegas. It's going to kind of be a big deal. I think it's called the ultimate fighter. Maybe like hold on to the magazine for another year. Uh, they decided not to do that. So my, you know, you know, this, everybody in the media space understands that you work in journalism. It's very fluid. You, you work in one place one day, you could be another place another day. It's sort of a life of free agency, especially if you're not an employee, um, it can be a difficult thing that way. And uh, I chose opportunities that I thought would help advance my career. And at a certain point, I decided, like, I'm going to make it a mission for myself to push the coverage of mixed martial arts to places that it hasn't been. That was a personal mission of mine. Um, it's one of the reasons why I ended up going to Sports Illustrated and then to ESPN. 
not because those opportunities were there and I was grateful for them, but I was like, this is a chance for me to help expand the coverage of mixed martial arts. And I'm not here rooting for anybody. I have no vested interest, but I think people should know about this sport because it's amazing. And I, and I know that I'm like amazed by it and I want people to understand it. Sure Dog was a great launching pad for me. I, I was at Max Fighting, uh, wasn't getting paid a dime, but we had an amazing staff and we broke a lot of stories there. I broke a lot of important stories while I was there. And I met Jeff Sherwood, who was the founder and creator of SureDog, covering events like the IFC and King of the Cage. He was a Southern California guy. They were around a couple of years before I was, really sort of covering the sport. But they had no sense of journalism. They were fight fans who created this hub for other fight fans to come and hang out and learn about the sport. And the one thing that they really did, and Garrett Poe, who became Jeff Sherwood's partner in SureDog, the database. The SureDog Fight Finder was sort of a a groundbreaking thing. No one had ever approached uh, the sport that way. No one had ever built a database as far as I knew, at least not in a big way. There was a couple of people like Ryan Graham, who had, uh, was a diehard, smartest kid you ever knew about MMA, but he didn't want to be a journalist. I kind of tried to pull him in the fold and, and he didn't want to do it, but he did a database. And I think he came together with SureDog and they created something really important. Um, you know, SureDog was an opportunity to make a regular monthly salary. They paid me a thousand bucks to start. They hired me as the executive editor. And I went about the business of creating a real journalism platform at SureDog. I, I took it upon myself to say, you guys have this amazing infrastructure. You have this amazing audience. We need to deliver them the kind of journalism and content that would not only make them interested, but help, you know, help, just help the sport. And, and I'm not saying help the sport in a best way because I don't care winners and losers. I don't care what promoter is doing what versus another in terms of who wins and who loses at the end of the day. I'm just saying I help by exposing the sport, by shedding light on stories that matter, that giving people a voice who don't have a voice, and more than anything, giving a vehicle for fans and the fighters to have a voice and at least interact. And that's how I always thought of myself in this space. Uh, SureDog gave me a great opportunity. I stayed there for four years before going off to Sports Illustrated and really wouldn't uh, change anything about my time there. Um, you know, even though I, there were some controversies along the way, and I'm happy to talk about them. Um, I, you know, I, I think that they all either taught me lessons or pushed me to the next stage of my career. And I was grateful all the way around. The first podcast I ever listened to in the MMA space was your, your podcast with uh, TJ DeSantis, uh, the beat down, the original show where yeah. you two were both hosts. How did you get talked into that? And, uh, what was it like sort of, you know, making that transition from, you know, being a writer to, to being a radio host, basically. It was fun. You know, it was a lot of fun. I always enjoyed being in front of the camera or talking to people in interviews. Almost from the very beginning of my career, I was put in front of the camera. In 2002, ESPN came to interview me. They were doing a big piece on what is this UFC thing? <clears throat> and who am I to sit down with, with ESPN at that stage? I was a young kid. Um, but I guess they felt like I could articulate the sport and my thoughts a certain way. And, um, you know, so I, I was totally comfortable doing that. And TJ just asked. I mean, simple... I don't, when people want to interview me, I say yes. I mean, that's, I'm grateful that people would have any interest in listening to me and I'm happy to do it whenever they do it. And, you know, I, TJ said, Hey, how about this thing? I want to do this podcast. I want to create this podcast network. And I was happy to join him and, and do the show. And I mean, we were just ourselves. I think authenticity is a really important thing. I, I was never putting on an act. I was never trying to be something I wasn't. It was just me and TJ shooting the shit about, mixed martial arts. And then, you know, my journalism would shine through in the way that I saw the world would, would shine through and, and TJ would do a great job of setting me up. And I tried to help him along the way. I know some people always thought I was hard on him and gave him a hard time, but I, I think he'll tell you today that like, you know, sometimes uh, he didn't see it, but now later in his career, he understands, you know, some of the reasons why I was pushing him the way that I was, because I saw something in TJ that I thought he could be really excellent at what he did and, and did. And, and you see now the progression of his career. That was a lot of fun. I love doing podcasts. I've done a bunch of them along the way. I can say, honestly, outside of this Patreon podcast, I've never been paid to do a podcast that I've been a part of. Okay. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it was more labor of love. It's fun. It doesn't feel like work to me just sitting here talking. Um, it feels like natural and, and I love talking about the fight. So it, it was, it would made total sense. You referenced uh, controversy. Uh, obviously, uh, people are watching this that are, you know, hardcore fans from back in the day. Remember uh, both the whole Ultimate Fighter season four thing, where uh, you know you revealed the winners, you know, lower down the volume, all this stuff. Um, you know, as, as you were sort of saying that, as this was going through uh, at the time, were you expecting the backlash that that you got, or you know, what, what was sort of your thoughts at the time? Um, you know, I, I, I didn't think about it honestly. 
Um, and I probably should have. It was one of those lessons I learned along, along the way. I, did, I said I didn't have any really regret, regrets. The one thing that I think I would have done during my tenure at SureDog differently was before I went out and published that to go to Jeff, go to my boss and say, hey, this is what I have. What do you think? But he let me have the reins editorially. He let me do what I felt was appropriate. Uh, I still think I can make a real case that that was newsworthy, that this was not just a reality show. They were lining up number one contenders for title fights. And here we are. We know who they are. And I tried to be res respectful of that. We didn't splash it on the front page of SureDog. Um, but obviously people listen and you can't control the information once it's out. Once it's out, people are going to be exposed to it, whether they want to be or not. Um, you know, I was still a young kid learning a lot. And um, that was a long time ago. Uh, and, you know, I think I've always been, I've always had this strain in me of saying, whatever, it's the information, it's the news, that's, what's ma that's what matters. Uh, if there's a repercussion for it, as long as it's fair, it's accurate, and I report it um, responsibly, then so be it. Let the chips fall where they may. And I guess I probably felt that as well. Although I was certainly conscious that people may not want to know because I did say, hey, turn down your radios if you're, if you're not interested. Right. Um, you know, that's been conflated, you know, sort of with my history with the UFC is the reason why I don't have access. That's not accurate, although I'm sure it didn't help in changing their minds along the way. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I had lost access and basically been told that I wasn't going to get access from that point forward. Uh, we can talk about the UFC offered me a job, which I turned down. And it, in that meeting, Dana's like, you're going to regret this. It was like, at the time, you're like, oh, maybe I'll reflect on it 10 years from now and feel, oh, I wish I had taken that job. It would have been a fun opportunity. Instead of like, you're going to regret this, we're going to try and ostracize you and kick you out of the business as much as we can. Uh, I didn't I didn't have that in my head. So at, at the end of the day, I think there are a lot of famous quotes from a lot of really great reporters out there saying, if you're not upsetting the people you cover in some way, if you're not bothering the power structures that you're covering as a journalist, you're not doing your job. And yes, we live in a cotton candy entertainment world. It's a niche. It's a small niche. But there's a lot of real things that take place in this business. There's a lot of things that impact people's lives. And now there's more money than ever. So I feel like my approach to the sport, whether it's the Ultimate Fighter 4 results or covering the, the really important drug testing issues, the testosterone replacement therapy, um, or covering the financial realities of fighters and trying to understand how much they're making compared to how much the UFC is making. These are hard questions. Looking at the UFC contracts, not easy, but felt like we had to do it. Looking at other businesses and see how they relate to the UFC and, you know, where does everybody else tie in into this business? Getting a full understanding, a full picture of mixed martial arts was always my motivation and always drove me. And I felt that that Ultimate Fighter 4 slipped in there. And if there were repercussions, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful that SureDog stood by me and they did. And uh, I think we had a really great run together. Uh, you know, we talked obviously about the UFC not being about ha happy about certain things. Um, you know, we, we see today in the news a lot uh, with, you know, mixed martial arts about, uh, you know, people being upset of, uh, you know, fighters getting a push that maybe don't deserve it, you know, like a Paige Van Zandt or a Sage Northcutt. But if you go all the way back to when you were covering the sport, uh, they had an issue like that with Rich Franklin. And you, there was actually a documentary that you're involved in. And if anyone hasn't seen it, go check it out. It's called Fighting Politics. It talks about Matt Linland. Um, what was the UFC's reaction to that at the time? Because uh, you guys made a lot of good points about what was going on with Linland and him not getting a title shot and them sort of pushing Rich Franklin. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up. One of the lessons I learned along the way is that when you sit down on camera with somebody, they can take that footage and use it how they want to use it. I right. was always conscious of how I interviewed subjects, well aware that they were giving me their time and trusting me to use that information correctly. You know, editors will slice things together to make things more controversial sometimes. I think that's a betrayal of what we do. And in some ways, I think the people people involved in that documentary felt like they were taken out of context. I'm not going to say I was taken out of context. I believe Matt Lindland got a raw deal. Rich Franklin is a hell of a fighter, but they certainly UFC was picking and choosing who they wanted to promote and who they weren't. And it wasn't the first time, and obviously it wasn't the last time. Um, there was a lot of reaction, a lot of heat. I didn't get it much personally. I think other people involved in the documentary did. Jeff Sherwood certainly heard from Dana White on that one. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it was me sitting in my role as reporter, expressing what I thought I knew about the world as accurately and clearly as I could about the world. And that's once I get up from that interview seat, I kind of walk away from it. You know, I, I give my two cents and, and sort of leave it on, leave it and go to the next thing. And that's how I felt about it. Uh, I certainly had moments, you know, a after that, I wrote an open letter to Dana White and the UFC about Sean Shirk and Hermes Franca testing positive for uh, steroids in California following their lightweight championship fight in 2007. They got a lot of attention. Literally, it's like the only vacation I've had in 10 years. The following day, I went on vacation. And 
I knew coming back the, the following week that there would be a ton of stuff out there about it. And I didn't realize how big it got. So I'm, I was aware that I had a voice and the stuff I reported on was sometimes difficult and, 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 and not easy subjects and not fun subjects. It wasn't about this guy's fighting this guy and let's everybody enjoy it. It was about, you know, really getting to the heart of what was going in the mixed martial arts business. I tried to answer that as best as I could. And I always felt like if people were bothered by that, as long as the reporting was by my standards, and I think I was pretty uh, stringent on it, fair and, and accurate. I've never been sued. Okay. I've never <laughs> been, people have threatened me, but it's just been verbally. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I've never purposely taken anything out of context or framed things in a way that I felt were inaccurate. That's all I can do as a reporter. And I can't worry about other people's reactions. I, I, I'd be happy if Dana White called me up right now, wanted to chat about some stuff. I don't expect them to. But just because someone had a reaction or was a negative towards you in the past doesn't mean that they will be in the future necessarily. And I can't worry about that. I just have to go on to the next piece. And you referenced it there. Uh, the UFC did offer you a job. How did that even come together? And, uh, you know, what was their reaction when you turned it down? Because uh, it's kind of an interesting story. It's a, Well, I think it's more than an interesting story. It's pretty a great story. And it's something that I haven't shared all the details about. And I'm, I'm not going to do that here yet, James. I'm holding on to some of it. But I'll tell you... Um, when the UFC decided to ban all the niche media in 2005, uh, after UFC 54, after the first Ultimate Fighter, after the first UFC Fight Night, ahead of UFC 55, all the niche media, guys like you and everybody else, they said, no, we're not credentialing you for this card. And uh, we came together, felt like it was a big betrayal, not because they owed us anything, because we were somehow indebted to them, but just literally at UFC 52, Dana White said to all the media, or maybe it was 54, it was 52 or 54. Thank you to the media who cover this space. Thank you. He l mentioned specific people in, in, in the business and they still do that. Hey, thank you to, to come out to the fights. Thank you for doing this. But I remember that specifically because literally a couple months later, they said, no, you guys can't cover us anymore. You can't come to the shows. Uh, I felt bothered by that. So did a lot of us in the business. We came together, we wrote a letter to the UFC, tried to get answers and explanations. They didn't want to participate in that. They didn't want to let us know. And no joke, Less than two weeks and maybe 10 days after they did that, I get a call from Dana White's assistant. Dana wants you to come out to Las Vegas, wants you to chat. I go out to Vegas, have a chat with him, offers me a job to run, to create essentially UFC.com, to revamp their entire online content platform, to be the guy in charge of UFC.com. And I was grateful for the offer. Uh, I think it said a lot about what they've, how they viewed me. Uh, I was curious why they wanted a guy to come run their site who couldn't get access to their fights as a professional working journalist. That was odd to me. I felt like if I went and accepted that offer, uh, I wouldn't be being true to myself and I'd also be betraying people in my business. Um, you know, I understand a lot of people would have said yes to this and I don't begrudge them for doing that. Um, Tom Gerbezi, who's a very good friend of mine, I worked with him at Max Fighting. I think he's a great writer. He took that job and I don't hold it against him. I, I felt like for me, I couldn't do journalism working that job. And doing journalism was the number one piece for me in terms of all of this. I love the fights, I love the sport, but if I couldn't do journalism, I don't know how much I would have been interested about being around it day to day. And I told Dana White that. I was like, I don't think I can do journalism here. He thought I could. I don't think he really understood what journalism was, but uh, essentially I, I passed. And I was making a thousand bucks a month at Sherdog. They offered me $40,000 a year, okay? I mean, the best thing I did was take that as leverage. I went back to SureDog. They gave me $2,000 a month. So, you know, that like I, I took it to my advantage as best as I could. I decided that this wasn't where I needed to go in my life. Let the chips fall where they may. And, um, you know, I, I think journalistically, I, I definitely made the right decision. And this will sort of tie into what we're going to talk about in the next half of the show in just one sec about the MMAJA because, uh, you know, there's so many interesting things about, uh, you know, how the sport's covered and everything. And, uh, you know, I think like most people would agree, you know, even watching this, you sort of set the gold standard for journalism in this industry, in my opinion, anyways, just for the work you've done and, you know, taking those risks and, and you know, doing, uh, you know, all the all the great work that you've done. Um, but before I, I get to that, I wanted to ask you, you know, just in your opinion in general, you know, why don't you think SureDog maintained its sort of its number one spot? Was it money? Why did sort of the MMA fightings and the uh, you know MMA junkies sort of surpass them and you know Sherdog not be where it is today? I think once Jeff Sherwood sold the website uh, to a new group, you know, anytime you change, it's the same discussion we're having around the UFC. Once there's an ownership change, maybe passions are different, motivations are different. Um, I, I can only speak really to my time there. I, I left in 2008. 
And I thought that I left the site in really good shape. Um, they hired some really well-established people to, to edit it in my absence. And I think there was just some confusion there moving forward, maybe too, too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, and then I think they started to really feel like the, the landscape was shifting. All of a sudden, you had much more media interest, much more competition for breaking news, uh, which was fine. You know, a guy like me goes off to Sports Illustrated and then ESPN. SureDog didn't really have to contend with that. All of a sudden, ESPN, which was a content partner with SureDog in 2007, something that I helped orchestrate, um, is now competing directly against SureDog. You know, the landscape totally changes. So you have other people come in, the MMA junkies, MMA fightings. They do great work. They do great jobs. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of things within the MMA space for why it looks the way that it does today compared to how it looked like in a 2008. Um, but the bottom line, and I think, you know, without getting into making excuses or covering for people, it's competition. It's competition. The media space became very competitive. SureDog couldn't deliver to their audience or was stuck in delivering to the audience the way that they always had done. Other databases come about. Wikipedia happens. People get their database information in other ways. Other forums emerge. Suddenly it's not underground. It, it doesn't feel like you have to be there for every single thing. So there's a lot of influences at play. I, I, I still think that some of the people at SureDog are tremendous. Um, you know, I was... One one of my, the best things I ever did at SureDog Sher was bring in Jordan Breen. Nice. Um, I saw him online, and it was just this kid rambling about Japanese MMA. I was like, "Who is this guy? He's really smart. I want him." And I went to him. I said, "You got to come home, over here and start working for us and, and doing this." And and he's there, and he still does a tremendous job for them. I wish he had all all the opportunity in the world. Mike Fridley, who's the main managing editor there, was a workhorse, someone that I worked with quite a lot. You know, I can't speak to where they are now, but I think generally it's just the landscape shift, media landscape shift. And, you know, you can be on top right now and tomorrow it's a different story. And I, and I think really it's just the reality of the media business. Were you ever offered any jobs? You don't have to say specific sites because, you know, we've got to keep this professional here. But were any of the bigger sites that are around now ever offered you a job? Because I was always surprised by that, that, you know, you never got sort of a, you know, a, a bigger role at, at one of the bigger sites because, you you know, just because of your, your back background and everything. Yeah, no, after I left uh, ESPN in 2013, um, I didn't approach them and I didn't get any offers from them. I wasn't really interested in doing that. Um, I had written uh, some pieces since for Bleacher Report. They have a great collection. But, you know, I was on more as a freelancer, kind of doing my own thing. And I was grateful for the chance to write and cover some good stories. Um, but, you know, I kind of felt like I wanted to, because the competition was so different, because it, it was apparent to me based on experiences for me, like attempting to break big stories, seeing how news was being disseminated, seeing how people were getting their news and how reporters were sort of, you know, working uh, sources. I had no access to the UFC. It became more and more difficult for me to cover the beat as a regular beat reporter. I got, I got away with it for a long time because I have a really big Rolodex and obviously people know me and wanted to talk to me. And I was, if I went out and pursued stories, I could get them. But at a certain point, like, I'm not sure that those sites really thought that I was someone that they wanted. Maybe I was a little radioactive for them. You know, they were still trying to establish themselves and, and, and why bring in somebody who's so easily uh, attacked by Dana White and the UFC because they choose to, and it's just become the normal thing, right? I mean, I don't deserve to be attacked the way they've attacked me, but it's just become normal. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think that um, we had different interests. For me, like I said earlier, it really was about expanding the coverage to mixed martial arts to places that it wasn't. You know, MMA Fighting, MMA Junkie were doing a great job. They didn't need me. I wanted to go to the Guardian. Right. You know, I wanted to take it to the Athletic. I wanted to go and write, you know, a, a 12,000 word, 14,000 word story on Mark Kerr for Sports Illustrated. You know, that huge long. Those, that was my motivation. And. I also wanted to move to the next step after ESPN. And, and I'm doing something with Bobby Razak, who's a very well-known MMA oh, filmmaker. Bobby's great. Bobby and I have a production company. We're leveraging his film library and, and other things. And, and we're going to tell real stories about the history of mixed martial arts. And that's stuff that we've put our time and energy into over the last few years. His next film, Mask, about Charles Lewis, the Tap Out founder, is coming out uh, in April. Everybody should go see that. Uh, it'll be on VOD all over the place. And then I think in Netflix, it'll be in May or June. So those are the kind of projects that I'm really interested in and really want to do. Uh, also more books. You know, I was grateful for the chance to write the Ali Inoki book. I have more books in my future. Um, so I wish the MMA Fightings, the MMA Junkies, and everybody else, Sure Dog, I wish them well. Cover the beat, cover the sport. 
I still follow everything closely, but the grind of it, I, I think I wanted to move on to the next thing. Right. You got to always evolve. And I think that's uh, sort of the key thing there. Uh, and this is, brings us to a good segue into what I wanted to talk about the second half of the show. And that is the MMAJA and uh, obviously your involvement with them. Um, just starting out, you know, when did you first become involved in this? And when did you sort of know this was going to become a reality, uh, you know, with them creating the MMAJA? Well, I, I, I became involved from the very beginning. I was one of the early creators of it. Uh, maybe the creator of it. I don't want to quite say that because a lot of people had so much input and I don't want to see myself that way. This is a collaborative effort of people in the industry. So, um, you know, I don't know, 2007 or 2008, we sat down as a group, I think in Orange County when the UFC was out there for a UFC. Then 2009, we came together again. It's been a lot of stops and starts, um, you know, in, in that way. But I always felt like it was going to happen. It was just part of the mature uh, maturation of, what the MMA journalism industry is. Um, every major sport has a journalist association, something to go along with it. I didn't think this would be any different because I felt like mixed martial arts would grow to a point where it was necessary. The industry is so large now. One of the great things that I experienced when we first did our initial membership drive um, last summer was how many people came forward wanting to be part of the group that I'd never heard of before. And that's no slam on them or anything. Maybe I'm a little out of touch, but I, I was amazed by how many people were out there investing their time and energy like I was so long ago, putting it into something that they love, trying to do journalism around a space that was really interesting for them. And I, I was excited to see that. And I'm excited to see us come together and collaborate now. Um, I think it's a necessary thing for the business. We're moving uh, really important steps now. We're in the middle of uh, the, the nomination process for our first elections, which are very exciting. Those elections will take place. Um, the fourth, I think a, a, a week from Wednesday, um, that's, that's our goal. So if, uh, members out there who haven't done any nominations, if you want to do a no nominations, you can still put them in elections at mmaja.com, I think is the email address. And if you're a member or you want to sign up to be a member, you can do that. Go to the website, mmaja.com and, uh, we'll get to your application. Uh, and for people who have been accepted, you people who, who haven't paid your dues yet or signed your rules and regs, please do that because we want you to be part of the group. Um, I'm excited for it, and uh, I feel like it's important. It's a big statement about where we are as an industry, and um, you know, it's certainly been a focus of mine. It's something I felt like all along we would we would get done. I don't mind the marathon. I'm never going to run a real marathon in my life, but I've taken plenty of metaphorical ones, and uh, you know, this this is certainly among that group, and uh, I'm I'm confident that it'll be an important group as as we're done. And you guys had your first meeting. I want to say was it in July at UFC 214? Was that the first yeah. one where you guys all got together? Yeah. And what was the yeah. response from that? Because I know there was a call in and I know people had met together. You know, I, I, there's a lot of people I know involved. So there must have been some challenges there just trying to get everyone uh, on the same page. Yeah, look, I think people want to work together and the challenges go away pretty easily when people are of the right mind and the right mindset and, and want to uh, participate in a genuine way. And I, and I felt like that was really what was happening. Um, yeah, I, I look, I think, you know, maybe it was sloppy. Maybe it didn't come off as polished. What I don't like, we're just knocking down the next door, getting to the next door and moving through it. And that was an important step for us as a group to say, here we are, we're ratifying these rules and regulations that we've come up with, that we've discussed for a long time. And we're saying that this is what you have to abide by to be part of our membership and time to sign up, time to drop your 50 bucks, time to sign the rules and regs, time to, you know, take that move as a reporter in the space and say, you know, I'm willing to be part of these, uh, th this group. And um, I was excited by it. You know, I, there's going to be critics about everything. I work in the media space. I'm, I'm not oblivious to that. And I don't mind it. Critics can make you better. Critics yeah. can have actual words of wisdom for you. A lot of times it doesn't mean anything, but you, you take it for what it is. And even someone who's coming from far left field, it's something you've never considered before as a criticism. Maybe you can improve off of that. Uh, my experience in MMA, James, because of the way that the UFC has treated me as a reporter, because of the opportunities I haven't had because of that, even though people think, oh, that's crazy, you were at Sports Illustrated and ESPN, I've lost opportunities because of the way that the UFC treated me. That's a fact. And I took those experiences in the best positive way. I said, what can I learn from this? How can I be better from this? Always. Because once I played into the bitterness or played into the feel like, woe is me, or I deserve this, or this should be mine, I'm losing. I'm, I'm, I'm taking a step back and it doesn't suit me. And I feel the same way with this organization. We had a lot of hiccups, a lot of false starts, 
but we learn lessons through the entire process, learn lessons the entire way. And I feel like we applied those lessons in July. We're doing that even more now. Uh, I'm confident that this group will come together and, and be meaningful and it won't just be a group or association in name only. You know, we'll, we'll have some teeth, we'll have some value for our members, which is the most important part. And I think, you know, just talking about criticisms of it, uh, just because, you know, I, I'm curious myself and the stuff that I've obviously seen on social media, I think one of the things that people have been kind of critical of is just uh, how quiet, uh, you know, you guys have sort of been since that meeting in July. And, uh, you know, we had an issue uh, with uh, Ariel Hawani with um, him covering the uh, the Showtime boxing for the Mayweather and, and McGregor press conference, where although I know he was still allowed to cover the event uh, through MMA fighting, uh, Dana White actually went in and intervened. I think some people were asking why the MMAJA didn't at least put out a statement and say, hey, we don't agree with this or something like that. What, what, how do you sort of respond to that? We weren't we weren't ready to do that yet. Okay. We hadn't taken the steps as an organization to do that and represent our members in a full way. We had an interim board. You know, I know there's a lot of interim in mixed martial arts, but our, our interim was actually a real thing, okay? We, we were not uh, of the mindset that our small group was going to dictate what this association was, okay? We, we wanted buy-in from everybody. And uh, we had discussions about it, and there wasn't a lot of discussion about it. It was pretty simple. We all came to the conclusion that this is this is a boxing promotion, okay? First and mm -hmm. foremost, it was resolved. There's not a lot of space for us to come in, and what are we going to actually say or advocate for? We all support Ariel. We support everybody in the membership, but we're an MMA journalist association at the end of the day, um, and, and that's where we've really felt like, it's not the right time for us to step up. And it, and it was resolved anyways. You know, it was unfortunate right. the way it went down. I think it showed the mindset that Dana White and the UFC maybe sometimes have towards media, the unfortunate mindset that they have. But that's nothing new. This association is an attempt to address that. But not only that, because it's not just an organization to deal with the UFC. It's about lifting the entire mixed martial arts journalism business. And that's our intent. So, you know, we can get caught in some of these things that feel important in the moment and like throw our name out there, but we didn't want that. We didn't think we were, it was the right time for us to do that. As far as the, the silence, totally valid concern and criticism. We heard it from members. I heard it from people. Um, it really just took us a while to get the back end together. We had a lot of hiccups in terms of, you know, getting the site up and running and like, you know, it's, it's just the reality of starting new and, and, you know, creating the platform for the elections. That's makes sense. We also had to form committees that created their own rules. And it, 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 there was a lot behind the scenes that was unfolding. We weren't sitting on our ass, not doing anything. We were right. doing a lot. We were creating the infrastructure for this thing. Uh, we were silent. We probably should have sent a member uh, notice out to members here and there, giving updates along the way. Um, maybe some of that comes from me because I'm maybe not the best at that, and I'm in charge of the member committee, and I take full responsibility for that. No problem. But here we are now. Um, I think you know we will have buy-in from people. We've already had a lot of people uh, become a part of the group, and you know I think over the coming years, people will really see the the value in a group like the Mixed Martial Arts Journal Association. I believe that fully. And you mentioned, uh, you know, certain positions within the organization being on an interim basis. So nothing's official yet. Is it still just sort of being like you mentioned the vote? Is that going to be when things are actually official? Correct. We're going to have a vote and the uh, board positions, which are now occupied in an interim way by myself. I'm the secretary. Uh, Mark Ramondi is the, the treasurer. Ariel Helwani is the vice president. Dan Stupp, who's the editor and owner of, I don't know if he's the owner anymore, but the editor of MMA Junkie um, uh, is the president. And, and we... We were conscious of needing to fill those roles to get this thing up off the ground. And, you know, some people were saying, oh, you guys are just appointing yourselves. This is some tyrannical thing, which is hilarious. And it's not true at all. Um, we just had to fill those roles to get this thing up and running. We are there now. OK, and I will uh, happily step aside if I'm going to run for secretary again. If people don't choose to vote for me, fine. But whatever the board looks like moving forward will be the first official board of the Mixed Martial Arts Journalists Association. And, you know, then we get down to business uh, in a real way. Okay, fair enough. Um, and we talked about Ariel Hawani, and uh, you mentioned his position as the interim uh, vice president, and he absolutely deserves that position. And just speaking personally, Ariel's been nothing but great to me. I mean, I've I've had nothing but good experiences with him, and he absolutely deserves that position. However, there are critics who would say, because of you know what he revealed last year on the sports media podcast uh, with Richard Dietrich about him taking money from Fox when he was working there, um, people would look at that and say, maybe he shouldn't be in that position. How do you respond to that? Uh, it's a fair criticism and totally understandable. I'm with the mindset of looking forward. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm not excuse. If, look, there are people who we turn down for members of the association because their standards don't meet up. And right. you know, I can hear it's like, well, what about this guy? I, I think um, I, I think you look at each case individually. Mm-hmm. And Ariel has become public about that. It was not something I'm sure that he wanted to come out public in that way. Uh, it wasn't the easiest thing for him. It doesn't excuse necessarily, uh, you know, making the decision to to take Fox's money when he knew that there would be a conflict. But unfortunately, that's the reality if you're a media person in the space and you want to cover mixed martial arts in the UFC specifically for the UFC's content partner. That yeah. doesn't really work in other sports. We yeah. need to move past that time and space, okay? That's what the reality was. It's not acceptable. I don't think people in the Mixed Martial Arts Journal Association would put themselves in that position to do it again. I think we need to move forward and past that kind of interaction where the UFC is directly or indirectly paying media for their coverage and people don't know. It's unfortunate. Um, But my sense is that uh, Ariel is an enormous voice in this space. He breaks news constantly. He's on the beat. I think he's atoned for that. Other people in the association have been part of media groups that have taken the UFC's money. That's just the reality of how the business was run. I don't think it's an indictment on anyone in particular uh, moving forward because they've signed now rules and regulations. They've committed themselves to operating with in a certain ethical way. And if they don't, then they'll be out of the group. You know, right. that's that's basically how we come down. So it's it's a forward looking movement. And that's really where I come down a lot of this. And I know you mentioned, uh, you know, people not getting let in as sort of being on a case by case basis. And uh, there's one journalist, I'm not going to mention his name, but you can kind of figure out who I might be talking about here, who's, you know, ha- covers women's MMA very heavily. He's had some issues in the past. Um, I know that one of the reasons uh, this p- particular person was denied access was because uh, he was taking photos with fighters. And I absolutely agree with that. I think that's something that is uh, completely unprofessional. It looks biased towards a fighter. I think in general, if you're at an event, you should not be taking pictures with anyone. You should be there working and not acting like that. But I do have have to admit i do see from time to time journalists that are taking photos with fighters and i have a big issue with that and i don't know why that's not sort of being called out a little bit more um you know as far as that happening what do you notice that at all and if so what are your thoughts on it um i would just say the with the reporter you referenced uh, our decision had nothing to do with taking photos um, okay. i was, saw a tweet that's about... that's what i'm referring to so i saw someone say it was because of the or at least sure I, I no I, look, that, I, but yeah yeah. On the list of things that uh, led us to deny, it was that was not a priority. I, so, I was going to say, yeah. Yeah. Um, but clearly, one of the things that we write about uh, uh, or make a point of, you don't go to events, you're not socializing with these people, okay? Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. if a fighter comes to you and say, hey, James, come take a photo with me, you take a photo. Like yeah. that's, But that's a different scenario than you going bugging a fighter. You have a credential around your neck. Say, Hey, I want to take a photo for my Instagram. You don't do that. That's not professional. I agree. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, there's shades of gray to everything. And um, I, I think we really have to use our judgment. A lot of these times um, I am certainly not someone who's going to take a photo with a fighter. I don't think anybody's interested. I'm not interested. Um, you know, I, I, if you're at the fighter hotel or you're away from the working conditions where the credential gives you access, and you see someone and you want to take a photo with them, that's your prerogative. It's not something I'm going to do. But we're talking about like in a working space environment, um, it's not appropriate. Yeah, and I, I, I feel uh, I, I feel strongly about that. I think people in our membership feel strongly about that. And we won't tolerate it. If we see members doing that thing, we have a committee in the Mixed Martial Arts Journalist Association called the Grievance Committee, where intra and inter relationships in, inside the association, outside the association, involving media members who are part of our group, they have to conduct themselves with a certain standard. And if they don't, um, there are mechanisms in place to deal with that. And I, I feel, like, again, that's all about putting the best foot forward, making the right steps to improve everybody, right? To get yeah. forward and, and, and grow this business in the, in the right way. Because, you know, you can sort of just say, oh, this is how you're supposed to work as a reporter. But... If we have a cohesive group who come together with a collective idea of saying, this is how you conduct yourself, and the people in the group betray that, then then you don't get to be in the group anymore. I mean, that's kind of like how we see it. And by doing that, we're hoping to elevate everybody's standards. There may be people who don't see the world the way that you and I do, James, maybe mm-hmm. young reporters who haven't learned these lessons yet, and we can help them learn early on and have them think about these things in a different way. And I, I think that would be helpful. 
Yeah, and another thing uh, too, which sort of on the same line, just common sense, no drinking at events. Uh, you know, the odd UK card, right. you see a couple of reporters that uh, might be having a few and that's, uh, I know the culture's yeah. a bit different. I, I think standards are different for different places. It's yeah. not something that we want uh, reporters to be doing. It's not appropriate. No, absolutely. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask you is what about uh, partnership agreements? Um, you know, for just a quick example, um, and, and again, I, I have nothing but good things to say about these guys, but MMA Junkie has, they have the right to use UFC footage in their videos. That definitely helps their videos. Do you not feel like in some ways there's some sort of partnership there and that could somehow be a conflict of interest? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, it shouldn't be a conflict of interest if there's a wall built up between editorial and Might have lost Josh Gross. Uh oh. Well, I'll still uh, hold up the fort here while uh, we may be waiting for uh, Josh to get back on the call here. Um, oh, oh, he's back. Are you there, Josh? Oh, Josh appears to be out of the call. Well, that's okay, though. We, we still got about 15 minutes. Uh, really touching on some great things. Uh, again, I love having Josh on here because he's, he's very honest and very, uh, you know, willing to talk about these subjects. You know, I asked him before we did the show. I said, hey, you know, I have, just have a couple questions. And he was like, yeah, go for it, whatever you need. And uh, that, that's what we need here. You know, the MMAJA, uh, I think it, it's a very important thing for the media. And I think, uh, you know, having a guy like Josh in there is definitely good to have because I feel like Josh is very objective. Again, I've talked about him many times having him on here. He's, he's great. Uh, Josh, we got you back there. Okay, sorry about that. I got a phone call and it ruined my whole thing here, so it, I apologize. It's okay, it's okay. So you're just in the middle of kind of uh, saying that, you know, it's not really a conflict of interest. Well, um, you got to think about it a certain way, okay? Yeah. So ESPN has a, uh, uh, a media rights deal with the NFL. Yeah. Does that make all their NFL coverage biased or tainted or slanted? It really depends on your editorial walls you build up mm -hmm. and your standards that you have. In and of itself, a content partnership shouldn't be something that taints your editorial content. It really depends on how you handle it. Um, Cause we see these media rights deals left and right. And there's no question about, you know, ESPN for instance has received criticism that it doesn't cover the NFL closely enough or it avoids certain issues, especially like around CTE and, and head trauma because of its relationship with, uh, um, with the NFL and the money that they take in. But that people don't automatically dismiss what ESPN does because of that. You know, I, I think it's a fair discussion and it's appropriate discussion. Um, I, I think the landscape, there's no doubt that the UFC made the decision to pay certain outlets to cover them. I'm not saying a certain way, but paying certain outlets promoted more coverage. I mean, that's simply a reality of what the business was. And I'm not talking about anybody specifically. That if, if you can see a direct relationship between that coverage and the way that the people are covering and it's a slanted vision of the world and it's not accurate, then yes, that's that's not acceptable. Um, I think the questions that you pose about MMA Junkie or any other media partner that perhaps the UFC had are totally valid. I don't think they dismiss their chance to work with the Mixed Martial Arts Journalists Association. I think you, you know, things get really complicated. MMA Junkie is owned by USA Today now, right? Yep. So, so presumably USA Today is making the editorial decision about this financial arrangement with someone that this site covers versus the kind of coverage they get. Uh, it's, it's a hard thing because the space is very muddy. You know, right. all of yeah. media is very muddy and these conflicts, they're not as obvious as someone offering you a job and say, Hey, come work for me. Sometimes it's not as obvious as, as that. Sometimes it's saying, Hey, you know, you can have access to our footage. You can get this stuff that we're not going to go to another website for. Yeah. People may start coming to you for that. Um, but does that automatically determine that their coverage is wrong, that they're covering things up? That's a hard thing. It's a yeah. hard thing. It's something to always be conscious of, James, I'm telling yeah. you. And I think it's an important question. And it's one as a group we will continually look at and continually monitor. And if there are questions that rise up about certain partnerships, we will ask them. But we actually had a discussion early on about should media rights deals with media outlets impact at all the individual journalist who wants to join Mixed Martial Arts Journalist Association. And we decided to no, it, it, it shouldn't. That we would look at each applicant individually, and in the end, that was the best thing for us. But a good question, fair question. Uh, of all the criticisms that are out there, I think it's a, certainly a, uh, as valid as anything else. And it's one that you always have to keep up on. Yeah, definitely. 
I got another important question, and uh, this one I'm sure uh, you know we'll both kind of agree on. I'm sure one of the goals with the the organization is to kind of uh, you know implement some change, and uh, you know we see certain outlets like Bloody Elbow, for example, that does not have US, UFC credentials when they really should. I mean, they're they're a great uh, you know website, and and also you have journalists like Kareem Zidane, for example, a good friend of mine who's doing some fantastic work. Uh, specifically covering, uh, you know, the, the Russian MMA scene, uh, his life's in danger. I mean, I, I know Kareem, he cannot go to, he can't go to Russia right now because he's legitimately has, you know, threats against him and things like that. Is sort of the goal, I guess, with this just to, you know, get those credentials back to, you know, people like Bloody Elbow and Jonathan Snowden, and also to, you know, somewhat protect or somewhat at least acknowledge that, you know, someone like Kareem is putting his life out there. Journalism is dangerous. Real yeah. journalism uh, carries risks. And uh, Kareem does a great work. And I think his voice has been very valuable for elevating important stories. And he does a tremendous job. I think I think his piece with, with HBO was absolutely, you know, really, really one of the finest pieces of MMA journalism I've ever seen. And I, I think it speaks to the nature of the mixed martial arts business and what you can accomplish as a journalist in this space. And the mixed martial arts is not just a little world, but now more and more it's touching these larger, broader issues politically, socially, whatever it is. It's important. We have to make sure that the people who want to cover the sport this way have the opportunity to do so in a safe manner. I mean, I we can't go around guaranteeing that if Kareem goes to Russia that we can protect him. Right. But certainly, yeah. that's not that's not our minute. But certainly, a guy like that deserves access to a UFC. I mean, it, it's it's uh, really disgraceful on the UFC's part and now Endeavor, who is controlling the UFC, that they wouldn't grant access to people who are doing real acts of journalism. I, you know, I could put myself in that group and a lot of other people. Um, you know, I, I think a mission of our uh, association is to lift membership. And part of that is advocate for members. Um, you know, it, it, day one, we're going to sign up and I'm going to go throw a letter down at the, at the doorstep of the UFC and said, address this. No, at certain point, I'm going to apply for a UFC credential and we'll see what happens. And then if they deny me, then we'll cross that bridge. So... You know, I I feel comfortable with the idea that I may never get access to the UFC again. I don't agree with it, but like I live in that world. I've lived in that world for 12 years. I can continue to report in effective ways without that. All reporters can continue to report on whatever they're covering without access. You have to be smarter, a little bit craftier, you know, but, but sometimes it actually takes, it takes you to places that people with access cannot go or will not go because they see the world differently. And so... It comes down to the individual reporter. If access is important, there's no doubt that I think the Mixed Martial Arts Media Association, Journalist Association, through its member committee, through its grievance committee, through the uh, support of other members, their voice will be heard. And hopefully promoters will take that seriously, UFC and everybody else, and address those grievances. You know, one thing I've never, ever received an answer for was why we were initially banned in 2005. Uh, Dana White said it had something to do with the sale of DVDs, which I know nothing about, had no effect on me or my coverage, had no effect on Sherdog's coverage. So I find that to be an unsatisfactory answer. And I've always felt that way. Um, you know, if if we are now in a position to demand a answers of stakeholders in this sport who on a regular basis, on a regular basis, credential media, uh, I think that's a positive thing. We will continue to fight for that. No guarantees. They can do what they want. But I think certainly the landscape it has shifted uh, quite a, a lot. It's a situation where they may feel like, you know, they have to respond to certain things. And I'm not even talking about me directly because a lot of times people muddy my situation with everybody else's situation. And it's one of the reasons I've kind of stayed away and said, you know, this, this association is not about me. I don't want to be president to start off. I don't want to be the forefront of this thing to start off. You can't separate me from it. I'm in it. I believe in it. But uh, it's about lifting everybody. And there are other people with a similar situation maybe for different reasons. I don't know why some people don't have access, but I'd certainly like to help them if we can. We only got about five minutes left, but there's a few more things I wanted to ask you because, uh, again, I just love the discussion here. There's so many interesting things I'm even learning myself. Um, one of the criticisms you guys get, and I don't necessarily agree with it at all, is uh, diversity in, in the group. Um, I believe, I could be wrong about this, help me with the clarification here. Is there only one female member that has officially on, on the team, and that is Amy Kaplan, if I'm not mistaken? Um, I would have no Esther Lynn. Oh, Esther. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, I'd have to go back and look at the membership roles. They're heavily male. Um, uh, there's no question about it. But one of the initiatives that we've talked about internally in the member committee is to uh, promote female membership, promote uh, membership among 
uh, a wide variety uh, of people. That's important to us. We have taken steps to really, you know, consider that. Um, and we understand in this world uh, that uh, with the Me Too movement and the reality of the media space and so many stories about media professionals coming out um, in, in terms of uh, sexual assault or, or really unfortunate moments, these are things we've also discussed in the group. How can we protect members? How can we give them a voice in these moments? Should they ever experience them? Um, you know, so I, I think these are things we're considering. Uh, it's one of the steps and one of the really important things about improving as a group to diversify our membership. And it's an, it's an initiative for us. And it's something that we, like me personally, and I know the, the people in the member committee uh, have thought quite a lot about, and we're taking steps to address. And Amy, Amy, especially, she's in the membership committee. I made sure to bring her on board with that. And I said, Amy, give me your ideas. Give me your thoughts. How can we increase female membership? How can we do this? And so, yeah, we're spending time on that. It's an important topic for us. Yeah. And I, I, I think that's awesome. And I think that's definitely something uh, that's good to promote just so it, you know, makes people want to join. Cause I, you know, we talked about it off the top. Um, you know, you have to be passionate about this. You have to really put the time in if you want to cover the sport. I mean, there, there's a lot that sort of goes into it and that's, I kind of get annoyed when I hear people say, Oh, there, there's not enough women and there's not enough this and that. I think you really have to want it. If you want to be involved, I don't think that's necessarily people being excluded, but rather the people who are actually interested in the sport. And I often hear too, there's not enough women uh, in, in the media, but there's plenty. I mean, just people aren't looking, they, they work for smaller outlets or they work for international outlets. Like that's something that I just, um, you know, there you are have a lot to look of women who cover the sport, James. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. And, um, uh, it, it's, it's a great thing. And, uh, you know, you have women working for major newspapers like Heidi Fang, you have the Brazilian, uh, uh, contingent who do a great job covering the sport. Loretta Hunt was a pioneer for female yeah. journalism and she's, you know, like me, uh, Received the wrath of the UFC for her reporting. Unfortunately, that that incident is famous. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Amy does uh, a really solid job. And and down the road, we, you know, it would be great if we can inspire more people, more women, people of all backgrounds to cover mixed martial arts. Because um, and and not just write about or blog about, but like be a reporter and a journalist in the space. That's what we we want. Because uh, the more people who uh, conduct journalism around mixed martial arts, the more sunshine there is on the sport, the better the sport is. I mean, that's my core belief about any industry. Uh, there is nothing wrong with shining a big bright light on something and exposing things that are negative because those negative things in the end will retract or pull back a business or an industry. You know, really, th those negative things uh, in, in the end are unhealthy for an industry. And so part of the job of a media group or a journalist is to shine a light on those issues. And I feel like the more transparency there is, the more truth we have out there, the better everyone should be, the better off everyone should be, including the business itself, including the stakeholders. And uh, we welcome journalists of all stripes, um, women, anybody. I mean, I, I certainly want as many people who are serious about th their passion for the Mixed Martial Arts Journalism Association for the purposes of that, their passion should be journalism first, mixed martial arts second. If you're covering mixed martial arts, hopefully you enjoy the sport. Cause I, I can't imagine covering this space without enjoying it. Right. And I know along the way I've, I've been around some reporters, reporters for more mainstream outlets who were called to cover it because their editor said, oh, the traffic is here. We need to cover this. Not because there was a genuine passion about who the athletes were, what the fights were, what the history was. Um, so, you know, you get people from all different motivations covering this, but if you're a journalist first, you know, come to us because, you know, we want you to be in the group. Before I let you go, I wanted to get your thoughts on sort of how the sport is being covered because it is a little bit different than maybe when you started um, in the sense that I, I think, you know, I speak for a lot of people in that uh, people don't like a lot of the clickbait stuff. I know that stuff is what pays the bills. I'm not, you know, dumb when it comes to that stuff, you know, like a, you know, a story about, you know, um, Mike Perry and his, uh, you know, girlfriend breaking up or something like that. Like, I do understand that that has to pay the bills. I under understand that. But do you not feel like there should be more emphasis as well on, on more of a balance, uh, you know, looking more at prospects? I mean, I rarely hear on the bigger sites of, uh, you know, up and comers. And, you know, if you look at like some of the bigger outlets and other sports, you know, they're talking about the NCAA, they're, they're talking about, uh, you know, up and comers, and you just don't see a lot of that in the sport do you what are your thoughts on that I, I think there's certainly a lot of value there um one of the fun pieces i remember writing at, at sports illustrated was the top 23 prospects under 23 nice. you know and and there's space for that because there's interest because fans want to know and james something you've done and, and other people have done create a niche for yourself i mean i would say to any young reporter any young journalist um 
Number one, get out there and hustle. You know, we've received applications from people who new journalists and want to cover the sport, but all they're writing about is recaps of Bellator and the UFC. Yeah. I'm like, where are you located? What are, what are the fights happening around you? Why don't you go to those fights, develop relationships, develop contacts? You'll be surprised how much you learn and how quickly you learn. And you'll be surprised how much people want to talk to you. Um, that's really where people um, can kick off their careers. And if there's an underserved topic, if there's an underserved piece of the sport, there will be people who come in and fill those niches whether it's prospects, whatever it is, I think there's an audience for it. I guess you got to pay the bills. Uh, I've never been a pay, pay the bills kind of person, which means I'm a bad business person. It's the <laughs> truth. And, um, you know, I, I, I get it. Uh, but this is not just the mixed martial arts media reality. This is a media reality, um, you know, across all forms of media. We see what's happening in newspapers in this country. We've seen what's happening to television. We see the kinds of stories that are pushed across social media, the engagement on those stories, what people really are interested, what they say they're interested in. A lot of times you got to cover a hard story knowing that the audience may not be there, but at the end, the story needs to come to light and there will be change because of that story. Um, you know, I, I think there was a lot of people who felt like, oh God, why are we covering testosterone replacement therapy again? But you know what? Like ESPN and Outside the Lines did a story on testosterone replacement therapy and Two days after it came out, Nevada said, okay, we're done with this. That's right. That's the, that's what the reality is of good reporting and good journalism. That's what it can do. And I think there is room for both. Obviously, I'm much more inclined to doing hard reporting, but you have to have the funding to do that. You have to have the resource to do that, the editorial staff to do that. There is so much. I just retweeted a, a really great tweet from the Associated Press a couple of days ago, or maybe it was yesterday, about what it takes to publish a story for the Associated Press. People go to my Twitter feed, go watch that video. You'll understand that it's not making a couple calls. Someone tells you one thing, you put in a story. And that's, that's like the, the very basics of reporting. That's not even reporting. That's doing interviews. So it takes a lot. I mean, you know, going out and requesting uh, information via Freedom of Information Act requests, that's not fun. That sucks. <laughs> like that's one of the worst parts of being a, a journalist. Uh, in any industry. And that applies to mixed martial arts as well. You you do FOIA requests of commissions or other things, but that's the reality. That's not fun. That doesn't pay the bills, but you get really important information there and you're doing your job and you're serving your role as a journalist. And yes, to me, I'd like to see those things prioritized, but it's hard to get those things done if you're not making money somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I understand the juggle that people have to do just do it ethically, understand the audience you're serving. Always think of the audience you're serving. Don't give them only what they think they want. That's a big mistake that media do. You got to give them some of what they want because you need them clicking, but you got to give them stuff that you think is important for the space that you're covering. And, you know, in the end, they'll appreciate that and understand that. And I think that's where real value lies for a specific journalist, a specific media outlet, for an association of journalists. That's really what our role is. And we have to keep remembering that. What has been, uh, and we're going to finish it off here. What has been the proudest moment in your uh, journalism career uh, covering mixed martial arts? Um, you know, I've had a lot of really, really great ones. Um, you know, I, I think, I think, I don't know, just for me, just advancing the coverage of mixed martial arts okay. in a broad way. I mean, if you want to look for one specific thing, working on stories with outside the lines for ESPN, it was, it was just a great, great thing to do that it's the enterprise unit for espn enterprise journalism is the kind of journalism we just talked about that's the hardest kind of journalism that's the one where you go digging you find a story you really unearth something that people may not realize or understand what's happening and you devote resources to that's what i've always been inclined to do it would have been easy for me to go off and just do interviews do feature stories write features cover the fights i love doing that don't get me wrong i love doing that but I, I would have felt empty as a reporter. For me, not all reporters feel that way, but for me, I would have felt empty that way if I didn't go off and, and challenge the power structure in the sport, because all power structures deserve challenging. If I didn't go off and ask hard questions of not only the promoters, everybody thinks it's just the UFC I go after. I've, I've challenged and questioned all promoters, all managers, all fighters, and, and not just because like I'm a jerk. Like That's just what the job is, and that's what I felt inclined to do. So I think just keeping that and, you know, now that you get me thinking about it, just maintaining what I feel has been my role as a journalist under a situation that has been very difficult. Um, a lot of reporters may have moved on to other things. I haven't. 
you know, I, I think, I think I'm too stubborn that way, maybe for my own good, but I'm still here. Um, I've had great years where I made a ton of money covering the sport money, more money than anybody should ever make for covering mixed martial arts. I just, I got way more than I think I probably deserved. People will look at you and like, no, of course you deserve that. But for me personally, I'm like, whatever. I did this for a thousand bucks a month, as happy as I was making, you know, much more than that. And now I've been, been in a position the last three years where I've struggled through that, you know? So I think just maintaining, just maintaining my time in this business. It's been 18 years, understanding what my role is, what my purpose is, how can I apply that in every aspect of what I do? And I guess, you know, to emphasize that all came to a head, the fact that I could do two stories with outside the lines and work with great reporters like uh, John Barr and, and Mike Fish. And Mike Fish was dominated for Pulitzer. And here I am, some schmuck from mixed martial arts, you know, pushing a story, making sure a story gets done, helping report a story. That's extremely fulfilling for me. And, and those are things that I'll always take away. And I want to thank you for not leaving this podcast because we've gone over time, Josh. I really appreciate how you taking the time here today um, and, and, you know, sharing your stories and also just the honesty, Josh, you know, that that's one of the things I've always respected about you. Uh, you know, what you see is what you get when uh, we're reading your stories or we're hearing you uh, talk on, on the radio or on a podcast. Um, just uh, remind people where they can find you on social media. And if you got anything coming up this week or in the coming months or whatever, uh, by all means, the floor is yours, sir. Sure. Um, find me on Twitter. It's the only social media I have. Uh, at Y A Y underscore Y E E. It's a funny name, but it's what I got. And um, you can check out the podcast with Jeff Sherwood, who's a legend in the sport and the media space. He created Sherdog.com. He and I every week on Patreon. Uh, it's fun. Um, it's much. Uh, it's him. It's him and I sitting around, not drinking beers, but we, we could be. I mean, we're we're just shooting this shit, talking about the news of the day. Um, and then uh, you know, I'm contributing to the Guardian. Um, I'm contributing to the athletic, which is a, a pretty cool media venture. I'm contributing, um, here and there, let's just say I have, uh, other book ideas I want to, uh, put out, but, uh, if you want more than anything, if you're going to check out my stuff, go check out the Ali Inoki book, see if that's an interest for you. And if it is, I'd be grateful if you plop down your nine bucks to buy it on Amazon. That'd be, that'd be awesome. And everyone can follow me on Twitter at Lynch on Sports like Josh. That's mainly where you can find all my stuff. And uh, we'll be back here next week on the MMA Industry Podcast, uh, probably around the same time unless uh, that changes. So keep your eyes on Twitter. And I uh, want to thank everyone for watching. And of course, Josh again for joining the show. And uh, we'll see you next week.